is our guest speaker today. He is a partner in One Sharp Design, a design agency that turns into um, conversions of web traffic into sales, which is my understanding of what you do from That'll work. LinkedIn. Um, he previously worked as a operations manager for the Container Park Sequence, a film crew. Um, and has done different feature length films, short films, web stuff. Um, and the best part of all is he's worked at Disney. I'll let him tell his story, and thank you guys. Thanks, appreciate it. Well, uh, thank you, Shana, for inviting me. Uh, it's really exciting to see all these entrepreneurs out here. I uh, never, ever intended to be one. <laughs> so you guys are crazy, <laughs> seriously. Um, I met Shana at uh, with the Chamber and through uh, Steve Roy, who I work with at the Chamber of Commerce. Um, I love Utah County. I'm actually new to Utah, so I'm going to tell my story first, and then we'll talk about entrepreneurship. So, uh, born and raised in California. Um, I'm married, got four beautiful children, well, three, one on the way, and uh, just love Utah. I thought I was going to hate Utah. I lived four miles from the beach in Huntington Beach, and I was set. I was working at Disney, and I was getting into Paramount, and I was going <laughs> to die there. And uh, things changed, market crashed, family moved to Utah, and then more family moved to Utah. And then more family moved to Utah, and uh, we were the only ones in California. Thanksgiving, the mother-in-law comes down and is like, you know, you guys should move to Utah. And I was like, ha, right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know you've been to Utah, they've got the purple turtle, you know what I'm saying? So <laughs> that was my vision of Utah. My whole family's from Utah. My grandma was like Miss President Glover in the 40s, and I just was like, it's not happening for me. So needless to say, that June, we moved, and uh, <laughs> I fell in love with it. I hiked Timpanogos. Have you guys hiked Timpanogos? I love hiking, and I came here, and it's like a playground. There's like a million trails. I can't get to them all fast enough. Hiked Timpanogos, looked at the valley, just everything was right. It, just, it was great for our family. But what I didn't anticipate um, was what would kind of come to pass later. So my background professionally, um, I started working for Disney when I was in high school. Um, I started out as a character in the uh, entertainment department. Uh, I danced in shows, and that's where I met my wife. Um, it was great fun. It was a great college job. Um, but what was great there is to get just exposure into kind of the entertainment world and I then went to the art department and I started building sets and uh, painting and sculpting and stuff and it was a lot of fun. Um, it was definitely a different job. Uh, I thought it was the coolest job in the world and I'm a really impatient person and so I kind of got bored with it and then uh, when I graduated, I was there when I started in high school, I was there through college and then I'd kind of reached as high as I could get at Disney and so I ventured out on my own. I worked for a marketing company and I remember uh, they were like a mortgage firm, and surprise, surprise, they collapsed. But uh, I remember leaving one night, and the second story, there was a window, and this guy was going through spreadsheets and stuff. And I was like, I'll never be that guy. You know? And uh, I cursed the day that I'd open spreadsheets. And now I live in spreadsheets, but I like my spreadsheets. So <laughs> um, after that, uh, a friend of mine um, came to me with, uh, with a script, and it was awful. It was super awful. But I just wanted to experience storyboarding. And so I took the script, and I was like, well, I don't care what happens in this movie, but I'll have these really great storyboards out of it and I'll put it in my portfolio. Well, that was my senior year of college and uh, my professors asked me to go to um, Comic-Con and represent Cal State Fullerton. And I was like, cool, what's Comic-Con, you know? And he laughed and I was like, that's so funny, <laughs> you know, what's Comic-Con? And, uh, and I went, have you guys been to Comic-Con, has anyone? <laughs> right? <laughs> so um, anyway, it was a really great experience because I got to go as an exhibitor and so um, I got to be there before um, all the other companies, were, you know, before people came in. So I got to talk to some different people, and there was all these great booths, and if they actually call it MovieCon now, because it really isn't about, like, there's like a little section of comic books, and there's like Hollywood. And so at the event, I met um, Mike Richardson, who's the president of Dark Horse Entertainment, and uh, they were doing a forum about indie film, and I went to the forum, and I was like, cool, I'm working on an indie film, I can get some notes and stuff, and anyway, uh, the films they showcased were worse than the script I was working on, and I was like, how are these movies getting made, you know? Like, this is trash, and you know, one man's trash is another man's treasure, I guess, but um, anyway, after the forum, he, he was just out on the floor talking to people, and I was like, well, he's a studio executive, and people are just talking to him, and so I went up to him, and I was like, hey, I'm working on an indie film, and I'm curious, how would someone like me pitch to someone like you? He's like, how about next Tuesday? Okay, that works, right? I can, I can do next Tuesday. So we went up to Hollywood, and we pitched to Dark Horse Entertainment, and that was the start of a four-year career with Paramount, with CBS, and we had sold a film to a company called Overture Films, who has been acquired by Revolution Media. 
Um, and so we, we had a film that we did, and there was TV shows we were developing. And as Hollywood would go, it's not exactly the kind of town that I could see myself staying in. Um, business is done different. And I don't know if it's a California thing, but Hollywood, um, not exactly the most reputable, ethical people. And so I found a quick exit. Um, and at that time, I had moved to Utah. So coming to Utah, I was still working on a couple scripts with some writers. And uh, I just figured I was going to be in film. It was where I wanted to be. I love story. I love narrative. Um, and then I met uh, my business partner, who at first was my friend. And his name is Ryan Sharp. And in my opinion, is the most creative man in Utah. So Ryan was my Elders Corn president. Um, if any of you are LDS, um, anyway, he oversees the, the dudes. Um, <laughs> so uh, we were working on a short film together. And Ryan's a very creative guy. And we had this idea. And it was a twist off of some story we found. And so we went and shot it, and uh, it was fun, but uh, it, we just did it for fun. We weren't going to do any commercial thing with it, but it was just fun working with him. And then uh, I was seriously looking for a change, and um, kind of in an answer to a prayer, Ryan came back and was like, hey, I want to talk to you about opening a business. And I was like, <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> you know, I have no interest in opening up another business. Um, so when you start a business, it sounds awesome. How many of you guys are starting own businesses or are starting? So what, what are you doing? Cool. How are you formed? Are you? Formed, going. Fantastic. Uh, what were some other hands? Car sales. Car sales. Wedding videography. Advertising. Advertising. Cool. So when we formed, we tried to understand my film business. Um, we realized we had to protect ourselves. So I formed that company as an LLC, and I had seven partners, which is insane. How, do you have partners? Do you guys have partners in your businesses? Good. <laughs> Um, my partners are my best friends, and they say, don't do business with your friends. Well, I heartily disagree. Um, in starting a business, you have to trust the person you're working with. You have to love them. You are going to spend more time with them than you will with your spouses. Know that. And we did. And it's a good thing they shaved and brushed their teeth, because I don't. So starting that business, it was tough, because we had to realize that we were in an industry that we knew nothing about, and we knew that we had to protect ourselves. But the interesting thing was when we started our film business, the Juniper Sequence, um, because we were a business, we were seen as a producing house, that we were seen as more legitimate than an individual with an idea. We were protected, we were an entity, and so we were, we were perceived differently. And honestly, more work came from it. It was expensive, it was rigorous, we had to get a lawyer involved, and uh, it was tough, but um, it was interesting because I went to art school. I would never, I, when I went to art school, I said I would never ever have to own a business, right? And what I found in building a business is that I loved it. I loved everything about it. I loved starting the business and having meetings and being creative and, and dealing with problems and negotiating contracts and dealing with lawyers and talking to studio heads and negotiating deals for our writers. And, and pretty soon I wasn't drawing, I wasn't painting, I wasn't animating, I wasn't editing, which I had won awards for, right? And I was working for one of the most prominent companies in the world in that regard. But it had nothing to do with what I was doing nine to five. And I didn't have a business degree. I just knew that nothing was going to get in my way. So I went to the school of hard knocks and building a business. So when Ryan approached me to build another business, I was like, <laughs> no, absolutely not. And so he said, well, let me present the plan to you. So after four years of owning my film business, I closed it down. And I decided that I was going to exit out, that it wasn't for me. I have a small family, and it's growing, and it just wasn't for me. And so I was just going to go get some khakis and go put on a polo shirt and go work for somebody. But um, I guess needs to say that there was different plans for me. Um, so Ryan came to me and he presented a plan. So Ryan Sharp's my business partner. And uh, he was a creative director at 101 Marketing. Does anyone know who 101 Marketing is? So how would you describe 101 Marketing? Um, they're yeah, and they're specifically focused on uh, lead gen for education. So like UVU is a client of theirs. Um, you know, University of Phoenix is a client of theirs. And so Ryan helped build that company from seven employees. He was just brought on as a part-time creative director to his exit when they had almost 200 employees and they were doing 50 million a year. So in Ryan's mind, he's like, okay, we were in some dinky office in American Fork and now we're like the fourth largest company in Utah and the fastest growing company in Utah. I'm gonna go get mine. So he called me, <laughs> what was he thinking? <laughs> So um, anyway, uh, Ryan presented to me a plan for a design studio. Um, are any of you designers in here? Designer? No? Just one? Oh, whatever. Yeah. Cool. So um, 
Anyway, he had an idea for a studio. Well, the, the idea for his business, it, it really wasn't, it didn't matter to me. Because when you go into business, it, it isn't what the business is. It's why. Can I? Um, so this is something that I've, when I work for a client, when I do work for myself, right, um, there's principles that drive anything. And so why is at the core how is kind of here in the middle, and what? Honestly, it doesn't matter. I mean, we, we heard a couple of business names. I don't care what you do, but I sure as heck care why you do it. So when Ryan came to me, this is what I asked him. I said, why, right? And his reason was specific to Ryan, and it hit a note in me. That'll be different for all of you. Um, so when Ryan uh, presented this business plan, it, it wasn't kind of a good plan. I had been in business. I know how to make money. I know how to lose money. I know how to eat your shorts on a project. I know how to you know, make money on a project. And I had been through that before. And so when he showed me the concept of his business, I was like, this is going to be hard. You know, but it, this is really makes sense. So it's possible. It's feasible. Let's do this. And so he came over. We had dinner. Um, and Ryan's a good guy. Our family, like our kids are all the same age. And it was just kind of a fun fit anyways. But um, I had to kind of like look in his eyes. Because as much as anyone you work with, it's important of what their credentials are. Their character is the most important piece of anyone that you will work with. I had seven partners before, and after a couple of years, I found out that two of them were number one immoral, and I, I placed that, I don't care who you are, but they were immoral and unethical. And when it came time to an, an ugly situation, you found out exactly who they were, and you never, ever want to be in a position like that with someone who you cannot trust implicitly. So that was why... I went to Ryan, and there's a lot of whys you're going to find on a spectrum, right? There's a lot of decisions that are going to, this dial is going to hit on as you turn it, right? And this is probably personal, professional, moral, right? Whatever. I mean, you're going to have different things that hit your whys. So um, I'm going to use this chart kind of as, as we talk. And so... Anyway, Ryan has striked me as a, as a guy with character. Uh, we got along, and I, I made a good bet. Because Ryan and I have been through some really ugly situations, and we have burned the midnight oil, and we have conquered things that I didn't think were possible. So um, why you start a business? So tell me, why are you starting your business? Okay, right? Why are you starting your business? That sucks. What was the other, other companies that were starting up? Or did anyone else have a business? Why? You love video? Okay, that's good. Are you, are you starting a business? Yeah. Why? Um, to get products to ship to the clients and stuff. Cool. Why? Cool, so you're driven by art. That's awesome, don't lose it. So everyone has a different why, and everyone's why is awesome for them, and don't ever forget it, right? Because in the middle of the night, three o'clock in the morning when it sucks, that why is what's gonna drive you, right? So our why as a business has changed a lot. Um, I forget the talk, you guys watch TED Talks? Yeah, watch TED Talks, awesome. Um, there was a talk on TED the other day that really hit me. Um, you guys are familiar with Apple? Surprised you guys weren't at Verizon. I was. Um, ordering my phone today. Okay, so Apple, um, when they do anything, they have a core philosophy, and this is huge in starting a business. It's not a pretty statement, it's not a marketing statement, it's an internal why. So your core philosophy is what drives your business. So there are a couple companies that I think they're doing things really well Apple, In and Out. Right? Companies like that, like you are not confused about what they are trying to do and why they are trying to do it. But I'm going to focus on Apple because everybody knows Apple. So this is their core philosophy. Challenge the status quo. Have you ever seen that on any marketing collateral? You ever seen iPhone 4 challenge the status quo? No, this is not marketing. This is the reason they do things. 
Do you guys remember before touchscreens came out? Then when you saw the first iPhone, it was like, <laughs> right? It blew your mind, right? And now it's passe, but at the time it blew your mind, right? Because they, they have you guys ever read Steve Jobs' bio? Okay, good, right? He was not the nicest guy, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, a lot of people didn't like him, but he never let up on this. And I think many of the employees work for Apple because they also believe this, right? So what is my, my uh, core philosophy, right? We, we, we believe that we're forward thinking because we're thinking forward, and that's like a cyclical statement, right? So a lot of the campaigns we do, we're leveraging technologies that are not even standard yet. So we design websites. So we've been using HTML5 for two years. HTML5 won't be standard until 2015, right? We do things on our websites that people haven't seen before. It's changing their businesses. So for us, we're always pushing the edge, right? And uh, that's what, what drives us. And so when you look at the core philosophy, which is this, this is the why. This is the core philosophy. This is why you're doing it. This is why you're doing a striping company, right? This is why you're starting a, a car lot, right? Because you have a why, right? How you do it, well, there's lots of books on how to run a business. No one can teach you this. This cannot be taught. It is self-manifested. And it means something to you and to your business. You can't find this in a book. You can't find this you know, from a, a sensei or a business coach. You will define this. The next step, however, is a lot easier. How you do a business, well, there's lots of great books. And there's lots of good suggestions. Um, and there's lots of layers to it, right? There's the operation, there's the product, there's, right, there's a lot of good pieces to the business on how. And then what you do is kind of how people is, is, you know, that's, there's, that's all over the place. So the other thing that you see here, this is how communication happens from the, for the public, okay? So if, um, so what you do, right? So what was, it, what was your company again? Parking lot, Parking lot striping, okay? Um, do you know the company Asphalt Zipper? Okay, they're one of the fastest growing companies in Utah County, mm -hmm. right? Th all they do is they take goop and they zip it through cracks in concrete, right? And they're huge. They've got a cool brand too. So when people think of Asphalt Zipper, they hit the what first, then they go through how they do it, and sometimes they get to why. People make decisions here. Somehow people know that Apple thinks that way. They couldn't tell you, but Apple has like a following, right? I mean, isn't it sick? Have you guys, did you guys watch the keynote yesterday? It's kind of sickening. People are like high-fiving each other and crying for iPhones. <laughs> but, you know, like, <laughs> they get it. And I get it. I, you know, I could spend $500 on a laptop, but no, no, no. I'm going to go spend $2,000 on a laptop because it, it's better, right? <laughs> right? Please tell me it's better. But I've bought into their core philosophy. So when I buy Apple products, it's here. So what are some big purchases you guys have made recently? You want to buy a home or a car or something? A wedding ring? <laughs> Bought a car? Okay. Why? It's a good reason. <laughs> so <laughs> um, when we started our business, uh, I wasn't aware of this. I've actually learned this recently. So let me tell you the tale of starting One Sharp Design. So Ryan came to me with the plan, and he had, you know, pie charts, and here's the studio, and here's an idea, and then what if we do this thing with all this other stuff out here, and then what if we did this, this thing over here with stuff and things, and right? So I'm like, that's phenomenal. So we had to get organized, and so um, I had just finished a business, and so am I in the right time in my life where I should be starting one? Well, if you look at statistics, no, right? And if you look at other things, no. Um, who watched the Olympics? Okay, did you guys remember that GE commercial? Um, GE does, has a, a commercial going right now that it's about, um, oh, I forget, it, like the guy's like running and then it's like a digital scan of his body and then the girl's like swimming and then it's like, you know what I'm talking about? And the guy's like, a GE, you know, we know everything there is to know about the body, blah, 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 GE stuff, right? And the girl like gets down and falls and then she pops back up and he says, we know everything there is to know about the body but we are constantly amazed by the human soul, right, or the human spirit or whatever, right? Now, I, that struck a chord with me because I've seen people go to their limit, then I've seen them go beyond it. And when you start a business, you are going to find your limit right away. You're going to find out who you are, and that's why I said character is huge. So be ready to test yourself, right? How long, have you owned your business for a while? Uh, maybe since I started. 
Okay, how's it going? Good right on, man. <laughs> I'm with you on that. So, um, don't kid yourself. You will never, ever work harder than starting your own business. And you should never work harder than starting your own business. Um, in art school, I remember a painting <coughs> of, um, like, Burning the Midnight Oil, I think is the name of the painting. But it's about the business owner. Because when everyone else goes home, when everyone else has gotten their paycheck, when everyone else is at the barbecue, who's at the office? Still working, right? The owner. You don't get vacations. You don't get time off, right? Saturday does not exist to you, right? It doesn't. And that's the gig, right? However, risk-reward is on any decision you make. When you went to buy a car, there was, right, weighing decisions. Being a business owner is the same thing, right? You have to know it in your heart, and you have to go after it. And so, yeah, I've worked a lot of hours, but I've also had a lot of reward, Right? So Ryan came to me and we started the business, and I, I thought about that. I thought, what's the risk-reward? And you have to analyze that for yourself. So here's some things for you to think about, right? Do I have capital? Okay, um, I'm only going to, what time do we need to end at? Okay. Um, I work with the Chamber of Commerce. Love the Chamber of Commerce. We just had a phenomenal business summit a couple weeks ago. I help organize these with Steve and with everyone. Love the group. So we had um, Jeremy Allen. Uh, he is one of the founders of Ancestry.com. You guys familiar with Ancestry.com? Well, he's doing well. Okay. <laughs> he gave this great speech about disruption forces and anti-disruption forces. So raise your hands again for business owners who are thinking about starting a business. All of you guys are a disruption force. You're going to do something remarkable, and you're going to disrupt the current marketplace. I love it. Now, for lots of businesses, there are a lot of anti-disruption forces out there. Do you know what I mean? Does anyone know what I mean? Well, there's lots of legislation about different businesses, right? Like uh, a food company. There's all, like, if you're going to do food, you've got to have permits and stuff and things, and there's all these kind of barriers to entry. That's an anti-disruption force. If you're going to raise capital, the SEC has 600,000 pages of regulation on raising capital. <coughs> Who cares, right? They do. It's really hard to raise capital right now. In fact, it's impossible. If you can do it, you've accomplished a miracle. It's nearly impossible. I've been involved in nine potential investments, and all of them went wrong because of regulation, because of this or of that. Idea was awesome. It was super awesome. It was bulletproof, right? We were air guitaring all night long, right? It fell apart because of regulation nine times, right? Different groups, different opportunities. It's still an awesome idea. Well, guess what? Anti-disruption forces put that down, right? So um, Jeremy Allen went to this like half hour thing of depressing us <laughs> all, right? I mean, all was like, business sucks. Right afterwards, but then he gave us a bit of hope. So, who's familiar with Kickstarter? Guys, Kickstarter.com. Write that down. Crowdfunding is hope. Democratized entrepreneurship. Okay. So, how about this? I have an idea. It's awesome idea. You are gonna love it. Right. I need six million dollars. You with me? Sure. All right, let's do this, <laughs> right? Okay. Or I have an idea, right? And I need a $10 investment, and for your $10 investment, I'm going to give you this fun thing, right? Who's with me? It's a much easier pitch, okay? You also spread the wealth, and we'll figure out the reward that you guys get. It'll be something awesome, I'm sure. But that's the idea of crowdfunding, right? Is that, hey guys, I've got an idea. So my buddy bought a wallet on Kickstarter, a $35 wallet, right? I, I bought a $30 wallet at the mall the other day. It's not awesome, not as awesome as his. So he bought his wallet, and I think 10,000 other people bought that same wallet. So a company that did not exist, that has no storefront, they made a wallet with their own dollars, they put it on Kickstarter, and I think their revenue is close to $10 million internationally now. The internet has no boundaries. The internet has no regulation. The internet is awesome. <laughs> he didn't have a website. He didn't have marketing, right? He just did something great. So whatever you're gonna do, Make it great, right? So it's, it's a good-looking wallet. It's, it's nothing remarkable, but
but people saw it. They thought it was cool. He shared it out to me. I shared it out to my friends, and we, we bought a wallet, right? We just built a company for them, right? So there's an opportunity right now in an impossible marketplace, and so I thought that was really cool in the presentation. However, when the election happens, I guarantee you there's going to be some regulation. SEC can't wait to get their hands on it. Anti-disruption forces, don't let them stop you. So you have to do your risk-reward. Do I have capital? That's big. I mean, Shauna, how often? Gosh, you know. So when Ryan came to me, we did not have capital. I mean, like, we, had, we could pay our bills, but capital, right? And so have you run into that problem? Anyone starting a business running into capital problems? Okay. <coughs> I feel you, brother. Sucks, okay? So can I bootstrap it? Do you guys know what that means? Yep. Okay, so those are two really big important questions, okay? Um, do I have a marketplace? So you came in with the web design studio. How many businesses have websites? Exactly. Right? We've got a market. How many businesses need marketing? <laughs> oh, all of them. Um, how many businesses need branding, print, whatever? So we for sure have a marketplace. Who is my competition? Okay. Now there was our problem. I'm not, I don't know anything about Utah. Pr the, turtle pur the purple turtle does have good shakes, though. Um, I didn't know anything about Utah, right? So how was I going to find out? I started networking. I went to the Chamber of Commerce. I joined a group called Corporate Alliance. Um, it's a phenomenal networking group. So networking is actually a really interesting piece of marketing, which I'll get to later. I went to another networking group called ConnectShare. There I met all of my competition. I sized them up. I chest bumped them, right? Like, I got to know who they are. In fact, I, I worked with a couple of them. It made sense to work together. I've got incredible competition. Incredible competition. There are web design studios every 10 feet in Utah. Freaking all over the place, <laughs> right? But I love it because this makes me work harder. Bring it on, right? Because now I know what my standard is. I'm going to be above all of these guys. And I'm probably not, but in my mind I will be. Um, let's see, what was the... <laughs> growth of the sector. There's a lot of print design companies that are going out of business. So this is for me. So growth of the sector. Um, people are doing less and less with print. They're doing more and more with web, right? We've got iPhones and Androids and ads and stuff, right? So I knew that that, that piece of my business was growing, so, or that, that sector was growing. So I measured that for myself. So um, video, where is your industry going? Why? Yeah, people are, people are shooting movies on their iPhones. I can go with this and go make a feature film, right? I've got HD on here. I can do it, right? You can shoot a wedding with it, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Difference. <laughs> um, you got a 32 gig one, right? <laughs> so um, I would agree with this. Video is only going awesome places, right? Where do you think your business is going? Love it. Love garage stories. <laughs> Freaking awesome. So um, what are some indicators that help you see where things are going with your industry? I'm like, it, what are like the predecessors to, pro to progress? For me, I've been going to the asphalt market. Okay. Didn't fun. know they had one. I didn't either. <laughs> <laughs> until I went for it. It's all over the place, yeah. Yeah, they have a conference and they meet three or four times a year and they discuss government projects that are coming up, big private projects that are coming in. Basically just how many dollars are Okay. Well, I was thinking, I wonder if, like, you're looking at commercial building, because I know that I don't drive to work, I see, like, I wonder if there's a way for you to check in with, like, um, a lot of the banks and see loans that are happening and 
you know, lots that are being approved. You know, you can see a lot of those signs that go up prior to, is there a way to, to get an in there, you know? And so there's probably different indicators that you're probably not even aware of yet. Same for me, like, you know, how do I know the businesses are starting up? Well, the chamber tells me every time a new business opens up, and I go, how's it going? You know, website, right? That's not my audience, actually. I would have thought that my audience could be anyone. It's not, right? I have a specific service that I, that I feed, and what I thought was my, right? You're probably right on, I'm not, I'm not um, discounting that. But who I thought my audience was is not my audience, right? Like, I actually compete with Vivint for one of my clients, right? I analyze you guys all the time, but I like your hats, right? <laughs> so um, Vivint's figured it out. They do great marketing, and I'm trying to beat them. So, sorry. <laughs> it's a little awkward, but it's fine. Um, <laughs> so um, this is big security company, and they do Dish and some other stuff, right? But um, my, my clients are small businesses that are doing 3 to $5 million a year in revenue as a start, right? I probably can't serve Dell yet, right? They probably have more needs than my office can provide. But from a small business to a medium, almost getting to enterprise, that's my sweet spot, right? So, and I've found that out the tough way because I'll take small jobs because I'm like, I can knock that out of the park for you. And I will spend more time on that small project and more resources than I will on someone who's paying for it. So people will come to me and say, oh, I, I can pay $1,500 for a website. And I, in my head, laugh. Like, there's no way I can make that happen for you. My overhead. Um, just me wanting to make it awesome, you know, just the way that I work, right? There's a lot of factors that drive what actually happens, and expectations are big. So um, who works for a service business right now? Okay, so when you work for someone in a service, setting expectations is huge, right? So your expectations as an entrepreneur and um, expectations of the industry are different, right? So set some expectations. What is your limit? How far can you go as a service, right? I've defined that for my business now, but it took a lot of really horrible relationships where I meet with the client and we have a great meeting, right? And everything is awesome. And we're for sure gonna sell a park for you. Well, four months later, what was supposed to be a four week project, we're banging our heads against the wall. They're pissed. I'm not really happy to see them, right? And we're just frustrated because I didn't understand what they wanted. I didn't understand my ability to serve it. So in the service business, think about that. So when you think of your risk reward, like, you know, think of how far you're willing to go and what it means to you, right? When I think of how much I pay myself right now, I <laughs> laugh, right? Because I'm investing in the future, though. I'm looking at two years from now, and I'm really hoping my wife's with me on that. <laughs> so how many of you are married? Okay. The person you go into business with is your spouse first, right? Now, having, a, and I, I don't mean to offend anyone, but a family relationship is, is critical, to your business. My number one support is my beautiful wife. She's not out there cheering for me and stuff, and she is definitely calling me at 501, hey, on your way home, right? Ooh, right? <laughs> but she is my number one support for this business, and I appreciate every day that she supports me in it because it's insanity doing this business, but I love it. She sees that I've never been happier in my work. I love going to the office every Monday. Sunday night, I'm doing this. I'm like, <sighs> right? I'm ready, you know, and she's like, you're such a nerd, you know, <laughs> I'm like, I can't help it, you know, I love going to my business, you know, Monday morning at six o'clock, who's in the office, this guy, right, and I, I will stay till midnight, but I love it, I love everything about it, I love the people I work with, I love the clients that we serve, and you have to love it that much, if you kind of like it, you go the other way, you have to love it, and that comes back to why, right, because when you start analyzing your risk reward, if you don't love it, it will swallow you whole, You'll go into debt for your business. You'll do things you wouldn't do for other situations. And so analyze your risk reward. Because here's the other piece of it. And I don't mean to, you know, to diffuse any of your entrepreneur's idea, but here's a job, right? You show up, you get paid, you go home. <sighs> right? You don't have to form a legal entity. You don't have to file taxes every year. You don't have to meet with the CPA. You don't have to have a marketing plan. You don't have to have a sales plan. You don't have to have an operational plan. You don't have to have a project management tool. You don't have to have an accounting tool. You don't have to have uh, service providers. You don't have to have vendors. You don't have to have uh, marketing that you have to do. You don't have networking events to attend. It's a lot, right? That's my day. Every day I do that. So I have 
about a 60 hour work week every week. Who works 60 hours a week here? You guys are awesome, right? So you're ready, okay? So you have to think, that's another risk reward, time. There are two things that have limits, time and money. The one thing that will never have a limit as an entrepreneur that you cannot limit is heart. <coughs> so I remember reading about Josh James. Does anyone know who Josh James is? Okay, who's Josh James? Cool. A lot of respect for Josh. Okay. I remember reading an article, I think it was in Inc. or something. Um, I think it was just after the Adobe acquisition. So Josh's company was acquired by Adobe. So how long have you worked with Josh? I've worked with him for two years. So are you at Domo? I'd love to sidebar with you later. I love analytics. Um, Josh James did something that's not hard. He did something that's impossible. Okay? He started a business, and he came against adversity and adversity and adversity and adversity and adversity. Right? But he stuck with it. So when he started Omnichure, I think he has the basement story. We were in a basement, too. I love that we can say that. It was just 30 days, but we were in a basement, dang it. Um, so he started his business, and they do web analytics, right? Are you guys familiar with web analytics, Google Analytics? Yes? Okay, it's huge. <coughs> I'm in analytics every single day. So Josh's company started. They had some employees. They had some clients. They started doing some things. And then money went away. And then people worked for free for him for a little while, right? And then they got some clients. And then money went away again. There is no more horrible feeling than when Friday comes for payday, and my employees look at me, and I'm like, <coughs> Hi, <laughs> can I help you? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I know what's in the bank account, right? There's been plenty of Fridays that have come by that I'm like, I don't have it. I don't, right? So my employees have done what Josh's James employees did, is they're like, I'll see you on Monday. It's all good, right? In a small business, you will deal with that. Money does not grow on trees. You have to earn it. Your clients have to pay you. You have to create a system for it. So Josh wrote in this article, they interviewed him, and like time after time he'd come home and be curled up in a ball on the floor like, I can't pay people, life is over, I'm so tired. So his wife comes in and kicks him right in the head, and she's like, you get up and you get to work, right? And he did, right? And so that was the story on and on. I mean, there were so many times where he'd face that where there isn't payroll. How am I going to continue going into this business? But he stuck with it, and that's where heart comes in. You can't measure heart. You can measure time and money, and people are really good at that. You cannot measure heart, and you have to have it. You have to have heart. So, was it like, is it seven years until the acquisition? So seven years later, the company was growing so fast and doing so many remarkable things, and remember the word remarkable, doing so many remarkable things that a larger company, who they were disrupting for, Adobe's like, I don't think Adobe was the only one, was it? No, Photoshop might have been, but I think there was a really large company that was Yeah. So a company like that, right, where it took an almost impossible solution when it got to that point, once you're successful, everybody's your friend, right? But I think Josh was wise enough to wait for the right friend, the right partner. So it was a great acquisition. Josh sold his company, lots of cash, right? That's a great day. So he started a company called Domo, and so they took an investment. I have never heard more criticism than anyone who tries to do it a second time. The, stat the statistics of being successful twice are nearly impossible. So Josh has a lot of criticism right now. Domo hasn't launched, right? So I invited Domo to my office, and I wanted to see their product. It's freaking awesome. Have you seen it? Yeah, who's in it? I forget his name. It was probably six months ago. Maybe. I think it was Joe. So they sat down, and they showed me their product, and I was like, <laughs> he's done it again, you know? Then they told me how much it costs, and I was like, I will kindly show your way to the door, sir, <laughs> right? <laughs> However, he disrupted the marketplace again. Right? So, possible. So, I, the biggest thing I want to leave you with today is you are going to go through an entrepreneurship class and you're going to learn a lot of great things. Take notes, right? But do research for yourself. Identify what you're going after and never give up, right? You're going to be wrong nine times out of ten. Own that. It's okay. Your greatest education is going to come from your failures. I have failed a lot and I'm proud of it. I've failed a lot personally, I've failed a lot professionally. It happens. 
Dust yourself off, get back to work, right? Because your greatest successes are going to be the education you got from those failures. Josh failed a lot, right? He's cool with it, right? He is not a failure now, right? But he owned his failures and he became something great. So Domo is, is I can't stand the billboards, dude. I really can't. <laughs> are you with me? Thank you. Okay, so, um, but I think that they've got something going there. You can definitely feel that the, it's a lot of fun to work at Domo, right? You can't deny that. So, um, he's, he's taken a great opportunity. But entrepreneurship is what Josh dealt with. Entrepreneurship is the willingness to disrupt your market and then stick with it, okay? Entrepreneurship is difficult. Utah offers something different that a lot of states don't. There is a hub of entrepreneurship here that is on fire right now. New businesses are popping up all over the place. I love it. I'm always seeing something cooler than something that I thought of. I'm always seeing some fresh young face that's like, I'm going to go get it, you know? And I'm like, get it, you know? It's awesome. And I don't know what it is, but Utah is actually in the country. So the Chamber of Commerce um, hosts a business, well, no. Was it the Chamber that does the summit at uh, Sundance? Yeah. The Executive Summit. What? Is it this art coming up already? Wow. Has it really been a year? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the executive summit I attended last year, wonderful food. <laughs> That's really why I go. <laughs> um, so, the executive summit, um, it's a really, really fast paced uh, panel. Are you involved with the chamber? Yeah, I'm actually right now the director of the US for the. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm Matt. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Love the chamber. So, uh, last year, um, Governor Herbert spoke. Um, uh, Matt was there, um, Matt Holland was there. Um, and they, everyone had like 15 minutes, and it was like a power presentation. I'm glad because when that guy got up about the transportation thing, I was dying. But it was good content, and I was just, it killed me. But it was great information. And so in that presentation, I found out something about Utah that's very interesting. You have a unique opportunity that a lot of states do not have. Utah is the third wealthiest state in the nation. Does that blow your mind? Let me t give you an, another interesting fact. You guys know who Goldman Sachs is? Okay. Goldman Sachs has four offices in the world. Los Angeles, big surprise. New York, Shanghai, where's the other office? Where's the biggest office? Not a coincidence, not a mistake, okay? Utah is going to redefine a lot of sectors. A lot of disruption forces happening, and this really excites me to see the size of a group, right? I hope I can market for all of you. So, what you see there is there is money coming here, right? There's opportunity coming here, and there's a lot of dreamers, right? And be clear, your idea is a dream, but keep it a dream. Don't ever let it not be a dream. Okay, so with that information, that's a really good indicator about what's to come. There's a lot of businesses coming here. If you go out Alpine, Lehigh area, there's homes, beautiful homes being built all over the place. Another indicator of economic prosperity, okay? Now, there was a bubble that burst in California, which is why Matt is here today, okay? Everything went crazy. They still haven't figured it out. The state of California is about to declare bankruptcy. The last year I was in California, now this is the real reason I left. So I've surfed my whole life. I went to uh, Santa Monica and I was surfing and I didn't, I didn't pay the meter, right? I got a ticket for, I don't know, 30 bucks or something like that, a parking ticket. I didn't pay it. <laughs> but that was around uh, March or April. I filed my taxes and I got an IOU from the state of California for like $2,000. Are you serious? An IOU? Because I have a warrant for my arrest for 30 bucks. <laughs> can we trade? <laughs> right? And you can owe me 1970, right? So I ran. I was like, all right, honey, let's go to Utah. I'm going to go get me a purple turtle tater bag. <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> You've convinced me. Okay, so three months later we were here. It's a huge indicator of a depressed economy. We have an office in California. It's not doing well. Looking about closing it, right? We have an office in Utah and it's doing great. We're very excited. Okay, but there's a lot of businesses here. There's a lot of people willing to take risks. So where you are matters. That whole thing, location, 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 it matters. So now we need to wrap up. Um, again, what I want to leave with you about starting a business, you're going to learn a lot of things about who and how to form and none of that matters. What you're trying to do is impossible, but don't let it be, right? You have to believe in yourself. You have to believe in your why. Know why, buy it. Because if you don't buy it, other people won't.
And I'm just really grateful for the opportunity to come here today. And I wish all of you the greatest success. Never give up. Believe in yourself. And I wish you guys the best. Thank you. Thanks a lot for coming. Appreciate that.